Episode 311, Continuously Pushed to the Background Bessie looked to the left blankly. There's the mission point here. Let's go in. Katie's cousin was full of curiosity now. Seeing the mission point, he immediately rushed in. There was only one computer, but there was data on the wall that was full of symbols. He asked the quest's character, a young man. Excuse me, has Zeke been here? No. The young man took a long time to avert his eyes from Noah. Had he seen wrongly? That's great. After reading the task card, Katie's cousin walked excitedly to the wall of data and started looking for what he needed. Noah and Ava left while he was searching. Ten minutes later, they came back with a pot of barbecue. They handed Bessie a can and Ava patted Katie's cousin on the shoulder. He was immersed in the data. Come on, let's eat, aren't you hungry? He blankly looked at them. Where did you have the money to buy barbecue? We don't have money. Ava glanced back and lazily replied. The owner of that barbecue restaurant is Noah's fan. Noah gave him an autograph and he gave us two containers of barbecue for free. The director had wanted to make them go through task challenges for lunch and was speechless. Noah was like a glitch in the show. Seeing how Katie's cousin wasn't eating, Noah glanced at Bessie with a cold and serious expression. Great arranger. Let's eat later, he said. Bessie had just picked up a piece of barbecue when she heard him. She looked up, her beautiful eyes full of a murderous aura. Noah took a step back and then whispered, thinking that others couldn't hear him. What if the program edits this maliciously and says you ate a free meal without working? He forgot that he was wearing a microphone and that the crew could clearly hear his words. The director was speechless. No, they won't. Don't talk nonsense. Why was Noah saying this? Bessie thought for a minute and nodded. You're right. She put the barbecue back, then walked over to Katie's cousin and started flipping through the data he found. The cousin was taken aback. Wait, what are you doing? I'm completing the task. She picked out a few pieces of paper. Seeing her messing up the content he had just sorted out, he stuffed the barbecue in Ava's hand and tried to stop her. Don't look for it now. Let's find Zeke later. This requires technical skills. So it's best to let someone skilled do this kind of thing. Since we found the mission point first, we'll form an alliance with them and share this clue. No way, Bessie said. He was shocked. Why? Pulling out two pieces of paper, Bessie read them and then walked over to the display screen. Looking at the two pieces of paper, she input a bunch of messy letters and numbers and said matter-of-factly without even looking up, the barbecue will get cold. In a few minutes, the screen full of garbled characters disappeared, replaced with the main page, as well as a pop-up window. High-level clue. Bessie took a look then took out the phone the program had given them. After taking a picture of the clue, she directly closed the page and quickly finished the job. She put the phone into her pocket, kicked the chair, and told Noah to put down the barbecue. The three of them ate and chatted, and Ava even suggested that they go back to find the ghosts. The program crew had set up many rooms and mission points. If they found the right one, it would be a mission point but otherwise, a ghost would suddenly pop up and scare them. Ava very warmly called over to Katie's cousin. Aren't you eating? The barbecue will get cold soon. Katie's cousin stood rooted to the ground. Ava regretfully turned around and asked the others, How do you like this barbecue? I think it's delicious, more so than that internet popular shop in Evanston. Bessie crossed her legs. It's not bad but barbecue is all about having the talent for it. Bessie ate without care, completely unaware that the crew couldn't even stomach their lunch boxes because of how quickly she'd solved the puzzle. Wasn't this designed for Sierra? The assistant director held his fork in one hand and the headset in the other and said loudly to the director, Isn't Bessie just a school nerd from Northwestern University? Is Sierra going to be on the sidelines this season? They had managed to invite so many actors and so many well-known non-player characters. 
all because of the Soup family's investments and reputation. The crew had easily hired these people. The directing team was at their wits' end. The chief director was also very tired. There's no use in her coming over anymore. Sierra is talking about her cards now. We've already given her the opportunity, but she didn't take advantage of it herself. He turned off the headset and stared at Bessie's group through the monitor. Zeke's group was wonderful, but compared to Bessie's group, they really weren't worth watching. Bessie's group was one in a million. Whichever mission point they went to, they received the high-level clues. If this continued, they could wrap a day in advance. Bessie and the others finally finished the barbecue. Ava had left some food for Katie's cousin. Previously nagging and talkative, he hadn't said a single word after this mission. Hey, are you okay? Ava lazily patted his shoulder. She didn't know what was wrong with Bessie's actions just now, and didn't even know what the mission point was about. She had only followed Bessie and managed to meet Mr. Grint and Zeke, and even called Noah her friend now. Her current psychological state was incomparable. Katie's cousin raised his head and opened his mouth, but still failed to utter a single word. He just stared at Bessie's back with a complicated expression. The four quickly reached another mission point. This time, Noah obtained a high-level clue, and they had a total of three cards. Bessie put them together and realized they only lacked one more card. They continued moving forward, preparing to stop at a mission point when they bumped into Zeke and the others at the hotel. Zeke and the others had yet to eat. They had followed the rules very obediently and went to the lunch task point for food, but Katie was still bargaining with the boss there. Bessie and the others slowly walked over and glanced at the restaurant. The restaurant had a sign of their discounts. 10% off for the master level in the poker tournament, 30% off for the guru level, 50% off for the supreme level, free for full stars. After eating, you need to wash the dishes to make up the balance. Katie was bargaining with the boss to wash fewer plates. You guys haven't eaten yet? The director's team felt very uneasy seeing Bessie's group meet up with Zeke's group. Noah and the others wouldn't mess things up, would they? The assistant director hesitated for a moment this time. We've talked through this with the hotel owner before. He's just a game fan, not a fan of any celebrity here. Many famous online shops liked doing this kind of activity. Something like the barbecue shop asking for an autograph in exchange for food wouldn't occur again. While looking at the menu, Zeke turned around upon hearing Bessie's voice. His dark pupils faintly lit up at the sight of her. Not yet, we've just found this restaurant. We have to wash the dishes for lunch here, but we can get a discount. Come and eat with us. He took a step back. No need. Bessie glanced at the hotel with interest. This hotel was decorated entirely according to the poker tournament's cards. We just ate some barbecue. Still holding the barbecue bucket, Katie's cousin walked over to Sierra. Bessie, Noah, and Ava had come in to look at the poker tournament decorations in the hotel. There weren't many tables and chairs, but the venue was very large and had many copies of the poker tournament cards placed around the room. I'm completely at my wit's end. One dollar equals washing one plate. The food here is extremely expensive and we'll have to wash hundreds of plates later. How could the production team be so harsh on us? Katie glanced at Bessie. Bessie, let's eat together and then wash the dishes. The boss sat on the stool, looking lazy, not wanting to give them any discounts. Katie's cousin took the bucket over to Sierra, who was sitting in front of the hotel computer. He paused and then shouted, Cousin, Sierra is at the supreme level. Can we get a 50% discount? Several cameramen hurriedly aimed their cameras at Sierra. The owner of the restaurant was a 30-year-old man, and only his side profile could be seen from this angle. He was obviously not interested in celebrities, but he immediately jumped up upon hearing Katie's cousin. Walking over to Sierra and confirming her grade and records, his attitude became much more enthusiastic. 
You're indeed at the supreme level, but you have to play a qualifying match to confirm that this account belongs to you. Everyone knew that players on the one-star supreme level had different skills. There were crazy monsters who could play professionally as a solo player all the way to the one-star supreme level, and there were also some who achieved this by playing in teams of three or four. There was a big difference between one star in the solo category and in the team category, but being able to reach the one star supreme level at all was already enough to prove one's strength. At this time, everyone surrounded Sierra and all the cameras zoomed in on her. Sierra had indeed achieved her level by herself. Instead of having to pretend, she straightened her back and directly took the mouse to click on the qualifying match. Many people played the poker tournament, so she found players within a second, even though she was the one-star supreme level. Oh my god, she's actually on the supreme level, the hotel owner exclaimed. Sierra just smiled indifferently. She had achieved one-star supreme level not by playing solo, nor was she on the level of professional competitors. However, she indeed had fast hand speed and excellent consciousness. The qualifying match lasted half an hour. Most of the people present played games and didn't get tired of watching, but Sierra still lost after half an hour. The people present inevitably felt regretful, but after confirming that it was indeed her own account, the boss's expression improved and he still gave them a 50% discount. Episode 312 your good friend Toby invites you to play. What the fuck, Sierra? You're so impressive. You're actually on the supreme level? Katie's cousin chattered like a firecracker. I'm not even on the guru level. It's indeed impressive. Ava lowered her voice and whispered to Bessie. I've been playing for three years and my account is at its full level. But I'm only on the rookie level. Bessie paused and then just said, You're also very impressive. Katie took the menu handed over by the restaurant owner. Yes, Sierra, you've worked hard. We've worked all morning. Let's replenish ourselves with some delicious food. Her voice faded. Any dish here cost more than $30. Even if the four of them ordered two of the cheapest dishes and a few bowls of rice, it would still cost $200 in total. Furthermore, even after a 50% discount, they would still have 100 plates to wash, and it wouldn't even fit on the table. Already expecting to wash the dishes for an hour, Katie blankly glanced at the boss. You haven't washed dishes for a year, right? However, she still reluctantly ordered two dishes. This store's food was expensive for a reason. Other than good plating, the dishes were also aromatic and delicious. She ordered a plate of greens and a plate of meat. A layer of chili dusted the meat, its aroma wafting in the air. Bessie remembered this plate of meat cost $50. It looked much better than the one served at their hotel. Are you still hungry? Bessie suddenly glanced at Noah and the others. Noah thought about it. A little. Then he turned his back to the cameraman. But it's too expensive. Don't worry, just eat if you're hungry. Bessie sat on the table opposite Zeke and then casually ordered two large dishes from the menu. She then threw the menu to Ava and Noah, propping her legs up and slightly raising her chin. Order anything. They ordered a pot of tea for $100. Seeing her nonchalance, Ava also ordered a drink called Cows Jump Over the Moon for $350. Noah ordered a platter of seafood for $300. While holding the bucket, Katie's cousin was still finishing the barbecue, and he almost knelt down after seeing this. He stared at them, crying without tears. Are we going to wash the dishes until nighttime? Don't worry, Ava comforted him kindly. Do you think the boss can bring out 1,000 dirty dishes? We'll finish the meal on credit, and then pay with our cell phones after eating. On the opposite table, Katie glanced over. Can we do that? She suddenly glanced at the menu on the table. The director team was speechless. A loophole. While looking down at Bessie and the others expressionlessly, the boss's mouth finally twitched. 
Bessie even kindly invited Zeke and Katie to eat with them. They don't have 1,000 dishes here, but we'll have to wash all the dirty dishes in the restaurant. Katie took a sip of the soup and finally recovered her spirits. We'll just wash them together later. Slowly picking up his fork, Zeke glanced at Bessie's fingers and pondered for a moment. I'll wash your portion for you later. Bessie took a bite of her food, glanced at him and casually poured him a cup of tea. Don't worry, eat slowly. The group of people ate without a hurry, making the director lose his soul. Pressing the headset, the director gritted his teeth and glanced at the monitor. Go and find some dirty dishes. If you don't have 1,000, then just find 500 or 600 plates. Do they think they'll like washing dishes? Let them wash. The group of people slowly ate and chatted about life in front of the scrumptious food at the dinner table. The director had to admit that it was indeed a scene to watch. Bessie even boldly asked Zeke when he wanted to get married. No one in the entire entertainment industry dared to ask him this question. The most important thing was, Zeke actually answered truthfully. After that, Bessie also asked Noah if he was single, and asked him to go out more often instead of cooping himself up at home to write songs. The director stared at the monitor, and suddenly felt like he was going overboard asking Bessie to wash 500 plates. For this meal, he was willing to excuse them from even 10,000 dishes. Film star talks about marriage? Noah discloses his relationship status? These two top superstars in their two circles occupied the headlines every minute and could practically accidentally paralyze the whole system. The days when their program exploded all over the internet was just around the corner. Director, we found 500 plates. The staff came over to find the director. He glanced at him hesitantly. Bessie and the others had already finished their meal. The boss glanced at Bessie and then calculated the total without looking up. The two tables add up to $1,000. After a 50% discount, the total is $500. Go to the back kitchen to wash the dishes. Zeke, Katie, and the others took off their coats, eager to wash the dishes. Wait. Bessie suddenly glanced at the boss and asked, This is a mission point too, right? The boss glanced at her. It's a hidden mission. Grabbing Noah's sleeves to stop him from going to wash the dishes, she lazily said with relaxed eyebrows, Wait a minute. I also have a discount. Katie's cousin watched as she approached the computer. He was stunned. A discount? Sitting down in front of the computer, Bessie opened the game icon and entered her account information. The group watched as she seemed to log into an account. Katie wrung her fingers. Bessie, we already have a 50% discount. As she finished speaking, Bessie pressed enter. Account information popped up. BM, account level, supreme, 20 stars. 999 plus people wanted to add her as a friend. Soon, an invitation box popped up. Your good friend OST Toby Yearling invited you to play in the arena. Bessie paused. She took advantage of her quick reflexes and expressionlessly rejected the invitation. The next second, another one popped up. Your good friend OST Toby Yearling invited you to play in the arena. As the two god-level esports players competed with their hand speed in sending and deleting messages, the group of people standing at the side still hadn't recovered from seeing Bessie was at 20 stars on the supreme level. They once again fell into a trance at their hand speeds. Zeke, who had never been very interested in games, watched clearly as his niece very impatiently opened her friend list. She clicked on Toby's name and directly blocked him. The friend list was online, and all of her friends were ranked accordingly. Their ranking could be seen from top to bottom. MC, 20 star supreme level. OST Toby Yearling, 20 star supreme level. OST Henry Hayes, 11 star supreme level. There were about 20 friends on the first page, but Bessie's hand speed was too fast, so they could only read the first two or three accounts. If there had been a pause button, they definitely would have read through all of her friends. Not one of them was below the supreme level. Ava, who knew this game, was speechless. 
Katie's cousin also lost his voice. Sierra stood behind Bessie, stunned. Everyone who played the poker tournament knew OST Toby, the god who occupied the game's homepage every year, whose popularity on Twitter was comparable to first-rate celebrities. They might not know the rest of the team, but they definitely knew Toby. Looking at the 20-star accounts on her friends page, no one could have thought that it was fake. After all, those who scored 20 stars were all professional-level game gods. Who could imitate such a level of skills? After blocking Toby, Bessie returned to the hotel owner to let him check her account. The owner was silent. She reached out and knocked on the table, her eyebrows raised. You can check it. Still unable to return to his senses, the owner just stared at the words, first district, written in the middle of her computer screen. No, no need to check. Nodding, she directly opened the arena to play as a solo player. She took nearly two minutes to be matched with players since she was at 20 stars. Katie's cousin was flabbergasted. What the fuck, am I blind? He didn't have time to figure it out. At this rank, everyone played very cautiously. Seeing Bessie's strategy in the beginning, the players originally scolded her for not knowing how to play the game. Her teammate's morale collapsed. It hadn't been easy rising to this position. Two minutes later, the messages started to change. Hey, let's form a duo. Seven minutes later, they were even more effusive. Remember to add me as a friend. Eight minutes later, the game was over. The ultimate supreme level won the game in eight minutes. On the endgame page, it showed Bessie had contributed to carrying the whole team to victory. Those who didn't know much about the game were also transfixed and at a loss. If this was a live stream or a bullet screen, netizens would certainly explode. After logging out of her account and closing the page, Bessie stood up and looked at the owner. She raised her eyes and asked, So is the food free? The owner's hands trembled a little, and he stuttered, I, I... Last year's match in Devil City had been the most unforgettable match for the first-generation OST fans, even more so than the international match where Toby first became famous, because in that match, OST BM had appeared. After the game, Michael had changed Bessie's name back, but the district service and her 20 stars remained unchanged, so the game points were still accumulated in the first district. She was still a solo madwoman. There was only one BM in the first district, and even if other people couldn't recognize her, the owner definitely could. He was one of the few first-generation fans. Fans who joined later didn't know, but the first-generation fans always knew that BM had been the one who built one of the best teams. This unknown team had played from the city tournament to the international competition, and had indeed seen victory. But the first-generation players had never seen BM. After so many revamps, the game increased in major copies and also in cards. The decoration facilities in the owner's shop were of the original poker tournament. Speechless, he took off his microphone, went straight back to the computer, and took out a mission card from the drawer. Then, he took out a bunch of keys, opened a safe behind the counter, and took out a photo which he handed to Bessie. Episode 313 Supreme Level Bessie The owner blocked the camera and flipped the photo over, revealing four people's autographs. He had gotten Toby's signature after the international competition. It has been almost four years. He smiled and held it out to her, pretending to be relaxed. Can I finally complete my collection today? When Bessie had first entered the store, she had seen the game memorabilia and recognized this store owner to be a first-generation fan. Without replying to him, she just glanced sideways at the camera and indifferently said, Don't film this. Then, she walked over and picked up the black pen on the table. She signed it, OST Bessie. The cameraman, who had been about to step forward, became stunned and didn't dare to. He just stood from afar and took a long shot. Finally returning to his senses, 
The assistant director stared at the screen and slammed the table, feeling the intense urge to personally head to the set. Shoot this. Aim all the cameras at them. Why aren't you shooting it? Why are you afraid of her? Go on, do it. Very good. The success of this show would attract a large number of Team OST's fans. He wanted to go to the set himself and aim all the cameras at Bessie. After getting her autograph, the owner quickly placed it into his safe and locked it. The stationary cameras placed on the cabinet by the crew couldn't record anything. Then, he took out the task card and handed it to her. Bessie, erm, this is the clue from the production team. This is a hidden mission point, and this clue could be obtained only if the game level exceeded mine. Noah glanced at the owner and then at Bessie, his voice sounding slightly confused. So, do we still have to wash the plates? Wash the plates? No one present today has to wash a single plate. It's my treat. The owner felt refreshed and turned to the cameramen. You guys have yet to eat. Are you hungry? Everyone, eat anything you like. Production crew, eat anything you like. Bessie seemed to return to being indifferent. She lowered her head and turned over the high-level clue in her hand. Don't lose money, she told the owner. The owner nodded quickly and changed his tune. Then I'll give you a 50% discount. The crew was speechless. Zeke and the others were also speechless. Bessie took the other three high-level clues from Katie's cousin and casually flipped through them. They had collected almost all of the clues and looking at them, she managed to figure out the escape route. Let's go. She lifted her chin and led them forward. Zeke tried to appear calm on the surface. Have you found enough clues? We have four high-level clues. It's almost done. She handed the cards to him. Take a look. Katie also pretended to be calm and came over. Her legs couldn't help but soften upon hearing the words, four high-level clues. The production crew's clues ranged in levels from low to medium to high. All Katie's team had found were low-level clues. Even the middle-level clues were very difficult to get. Just look at Zeke's shooting, for example. Hitting the red hearts, with four out of eight shots was required for a middle-level clue, and the high-level clue required all eight shots to hit hearts. At such a long distance, it was already impressive that Zeke hadn't missed the target. But to hit all eight targets was no different than climbing to the sky in Katie's eyes. This was a difficulty designed for Olympic shooters. Thus, high-level clues were almost unobtainable in her eyes. Walking over to Zeke, she glanced at the mission card in his hand. On it was written, high-level clue. She was speechless. The town was very strange, but four high-level clues were enough for their escape. It was currently 2.30 in the afternoon. The filming ended ahead of schedule. Everyone had to go back and calm themselves down. Had they hired a sniper? Back at the hotel, the director was busy preparing rooms for Ava and Noah. They were Bessie's guests, and one of them was even a member of the Evanston Violin Association, so they naturally were treated like divine beings. You don't have to prepare Ava's. Bessie unscrewed the thermos cup handed over to her by Zeke's manager and took a sip. Is she leaving today? The director asked nervously. Zeke and Ava both turned to Bessie. Shaking her head, Bessie swallowed and screwed the cap back on. She can take my room. Ava was shocked. What about you? Tucker will continue the recording. I'm not staying. After saying this, Bessie went upstairs with the thermos. Zeke headed upstairs as well. Confused, the director followed them. Tucker's doctor said that he can't record the show for another week. He is already recovered. Bessie slowly replied. How's that possible? The director asked in disbelief. How long had it been? On the third floor, Bessie stopped in front of Zeke's door and kicked it with her foot. Tucker's foot hasn't recovered yet. Wait, I have the key. Zeke's manager took a step forward. He took out the key and was about to open the door, but Tucker opened it from inside. Holding the game console, Tucker glanced at him, and his long, curly eyelashes shot up. Bessie, Uncle Zeke, you're back. Then he took two steps to the side to let them in. 
Instead of going in, Bessie just leaned on the door with her arms folded. She glanced at the director and casually smiled. See, he's fine. No, he couldn't be. The director stared at Tucker. His movement was extremely nimble. So were his steps. But just a few days ago, the production crew had clearly witnessed how swollen his foot had been. The doctor had confirmed with them that it would take at least four or five days for him to recuperate before going to the set again. Only two days had passed since then. How was he all right already? The director almost bore a hole through Tucker's foot with his stare. Are you leaving this afternoon? Zeke looked at her, tapping the thermos cup absentmindedly with her long, white fingers. Bessie replied after thinking about it. No, I'm leaving at 7 a.m. tomorrow. I'm staying at a house at the town entrance. You guys can come to find me after the show. Aware that she had some friends here, Zeke didn't delve into it and just slightly nodded. Okay. Bessie returned to her room to pack her things. The director stayed with Zeke. After Zeke's manager closed the door, he faintly glanced at him. How come your nephew's foot healed so quickly? In disbelief, the manager had gone to check on his foot. His ankle had been a little swollen last night, but it had all disappeared now without a trace of injury. What did you do today? He asked Tucker curiously. Directly walking to the table, Zeke picked up a white bottle on the table and lowered his eyelashes. He swept his gaze over the gaping manager and director silently. Zeke remembered that this was the medicine Bessie gave Tucker yesterday afternoon. In Katie's room, Katie's cousin leaned back in his chair with a computer on his lap, his expression a little startled. With a click, Katie opened the door and came in with her manager. I didn't expect Bessie to leave the program so soon. I still wanted to wrap up filming early tomorrow, too. She looked down at her phone. After receiving this news from the director, Katie had gone to Bessie to bid farewell and add her on Twitter. She's not a celebrity and doesn't have Twitter. Katie felt a little regretful. Otherwise, we could follow each other. She has Twitter? Katie's cousin suddenly reacted and sat upright. She's not recording anymore? Katie nodded. No, Tucker's foot is better. Before she finished speaking, the cousin left with a gust of wind closing the door with a bang. It's so weird. Katie looked at the computer placed on the table by her cousin, which showed the poker tournament's page. Someone's homepage was displayed on it. They were from the first district. The winning rate was 100%. The name was BM. Katie squinted. Isn't this Bessie's account from just now? How did he manage to find it? Bessie packed up her things. She only had a bag in her room and nothing much else. The other clothes that Marvin had sent later on were mostly unused. She kept those that she had worn and left the rest for Ava. Ava and her manager helped her pack up, then walked her downstairs with Zeke, Noah, and the others. Bessie didn't have them go out with her since fans were squatting outside. She stopped in front of the hotel. As she was going out, Katie's cousin ran downstairs. Wait. Throwing her backpack over her shoulders, Bessie stood still and looked up. Katie's cousin chased after her, panting, and finally caught up to her. Are you the OST BM who played in Devil City with Team OST last year? The BM on Twitter. Your hand speed style is exactly the same as hers. Although he asked interrogatively, his tone sounded very convinced. Bessie stepped back and coldly replied, No, I'm not. Katie's cousin was a fanboy. Yes, yes you are. No one else was a solo player with 20 stars in the first district. Her record of just eight minutes in the game just now, combined with her violent tactics, was almost the same as in the original game. Even if he wasn't a fan of Team OST, he had watched the game in Devil City over and over again, so how could he not recognize her? His voice was very loud. Putting on her black earphones, Bessie's expression was cold and emotionless. I already said no. Before leaving, she glanced at him. Don't follow me, I might beat you up. She squeezed her fist. Even so, you're BM, you are. 
Katie's cousin followed her and continued moving forward while chattering endlessly. He walked for two minutes. At the intersection, Bessie took out her hat and put it snugly on her head. Marvin, waiting at the intersection, had sensitive ears and immediately heard this. He walked over, grabbed Katie's cousin's hands with his left hand and covered his mouth with his right hand. Miss Miller, go ahead. Marvin said. Bessie disappeared into the small house. Only then did Marvin let go. He glanced at Katie's cousin with a blank face. You're too noisy. Even if she's really BM, you'll never hear it from her. After sending him away, Marvin returned to the small house. He heard from Bessie that Tucker's foot had recovered and she didn't need to continue recording. Marvin fell in a daze and realized that this was the effect of Michael threatening Daniel. Episode 314, Bessie's Footage In the small house, Michael was sitting at the stone table. He flipped through a book with one hand and held a teacup in the other. Another cup of tea was placed opposite him. Bessie casually threw the backpack on the table, sat across from him, and took a sip of tea. Without looking up, Michael calmly asked, You're not playing anymore? No. Bessie put down the teacup and supported her chin with her fingers. Michael put down his book and sat thinking for a moment. He pointed his finger at the table. Is it because you bumped into a fan? You saw? Bessie looked up and raised an eyebrow slightly, but her face was emotionless. And she stared at him with her beautiful almond eyes. Michael coughed and vaguely said, I told Robert to show me the monitor feed. Then he looked up at the sky. Staring at him, Bessie raised an eyebrow. What for? Finally, Michael couldn't help but smile. He lowered his eyes. They were dark and beautiful and curved slightly. His voice was serious and gentle, but somewhat grudging. You like your uncle? Otherwise, she wouldn't have helped him on the show. He's okay. Bessie reached out to casually knock on the table. He treats Tucker very well. I see. Michael slightly nodded, deep in thought. Reaching out for her phone, Bessie scrolled through it and saw a Twitter message from Robert. Are you in Honolulu? Lazily, she replied, Yeah. In Evanston, Robert suddenly leapt up. Ignoring the documents piled on his desk, he pulled his chair, stood up hurriedly, and instructed the assistant, Prepare the earliest flight to Hawaii. Having gone to the laboratory to see Daniel today, Robert found out that Daniel hadn't slept for two nights just to push out the experimental medicine for Michael. He had also sent it to Hawaii. Only one person could make Michael anxious. Bessie. And because Michael had asked him to see the monitor feed, Robert walked outside with his phone and called the program director. President Soup, tomorrow's meeting. The secretary held the itinerary. Robert didn't even look back. Push it back. Glancing at the closed elevator door, the others exchanged glances. President Soup, what could possibly make him delay the big conference tomorrow? Back in Hawaii, the assistant director was in the studio. He propped his legs and sat humming on the stool. The director came in. Why do you look like this? Seeing his dark expression, the assistant director threw a bottle of beer over. Come on, celebrate. You haven't gone silly from joy, have you? The director shook his head. The assistant director glanced at him and opened a can of beer. Just because Mr. Miller's niece isn't recording anymore? Actually, it's okay. The material we've obtained these two days is enough for us to shoot to fame. Don't be too greedy. This kind of personality. I'm afraid of her in the long run. He was afraid that if she stayed on, one day she would even invite his boss. Which show could invite Zeke and Noah at the same time? Forget the two of them, just Noah alone. They couldn't afford to invite them in a lifetime. And Team OST's popularity in the poker tournament? No. The director sighed, full of worry. I just received the notice that the executive of the program will arrive tomorrow morning. 
Is it because he isn't satisfied with Sierra's screen time and is coming to ask us to delete Bessie's footage? The Soup Corporation had invested a lot of money into this show, so much so that the program could film extravagantly from the first to last episode and could even book the entire town. It wasn't just that the Soup family was rich and imposing. The cast now included Zeke, Katie, and even Noah, so the director wasn't worried about getting sponsors. The main problem was, the Soup Corporation wasn't just a matter of money. Given the Soup Corporation's current weight in Evanston, one word from President Soup could block this program from every network in America. Sierra's value to the Soup Corporation was obvious through their huge investment and efforts to forge a relationship with a production group. Now, the show's executive was even personally coming to set. Holding a beer, the director's eyebrows were tensed. Aside from Zeke and Noah, who were heavyweights in the entertainment industry, they would really be put in a spot if they had to deliberately delete Bessie's screen time. He himself couldn't bear to delete her shots as he had a gut feeling that, if he missed this chance, he would never have a chance to film her again. How's the situation with Sierra? Originally carefree, the assistant director squeezed the beer can involuntarily upon hearing this and stood up. Aren't the Soup Corporation's people going overboard? It's only the first two episodes and we've already created opportunities for Sierra according to the script. She couldn't grasp it herself. What does it have to do with Bessie? There are ten more episodes. Isn't it enough for her to showcase her character? The director glanced faintly at him. With Bessie in front, even if there are 100 episodes behind, Sierra won't be able to shoot to fame. It wasn't just that her character collided with Bessie's, but she was lagging miles behind her as well. Furthermore, as if she had seen through the character set up for Sierra, Bessie neither went to the targets set by the program group nor the physical strongholds, and only went to those designated for Sierra. If it weren't for the script, the director would have thought that Bessie was deliberately going against Sierra. After all, how dare she set up dominance in front of a Northwestern University school nerd? How dare she show off her technical skills in front of a 20-star player? Was she crazy? It was precisely because of this that the director was worried the Soup Corporation wanted to delete Bessie's shots. The biggest purpose of this show from the beginning was to set up a chance for Sierra to become famous. This computer nerd Bessie was flying in the face of that plan. What did Sierra's manager say? The assistant director already understood the main concern. The director shook his head, his eyes darkening. I talked to him just now and he told me to delete the footage of the physics question. Also, he doesn't seem to like Ava very much. The entertainment industry was such a hassle. The director was reluctant to delete Bessie's shots, and Ava had also been brilliant, though it wasn't impossible to delete her shots. Since Sierra's manager had been so blunt, the director was already discussing cutting Ava's shots. I'll talk to Ava and the others later. Knocking on the table, he thought for a while and pursed his lips. She won't have to record tomorrow anymore. He hoped to exchange her scenes for Bessie's. They glanced at each other and planned all night for how to save more of Bessie's footage. In the meantime, the executive arrived and didn't even eat dinner. Sierra was sulking in her room. She had embarrassed herself several times over the past two days since Bessie's arrival. Since her debut, she had been in Lady Luck's favor, and that was how she had come to this show. Katie had also treated her kindly and even followed her on Twitter. The production crew took great care of her. Before yesterday, she thought she would shoot to fame with this show. That was until Bessie's arrival. The character set up for her had completely collapsed in front of Bessie, and she had embarrassed herself several times as well. She had finally found a chance to showcase her character today, but Bessie's impact had stolen the limelight again. She felt like a circus clown. Her manager and assistant knocked on the door before opening it. Sierra, let me tell you two pieces of good news. Her manager said. Sierra was scrolling through Twitter at this time. What? The first piece of good news. 
the director told me that because of the program's group negligence, the physics problem was wrong, so they've decided to delete this scene. Her manager sat down opposite her and smiled. Sierra looked up, pleasantly surprised. What about the second piece of good news? Tucker's foot suddenly healed, so Bessie won't be filming from tomorrow onwards. The manager lowered his voice and excitedly said, I already told you, Lady Luck is shining on you. Otherwise, how could Tucker's foot have recovered in two days? Did you see his foot that day? It was so swollen. It doesn't make sense for it to have just healed in two days. After getting rid of Ava, the manager's path had become extremely smooth. He felt like terminating the contract with her was the best decision he had made in his life. Without Ava, his team had risen multiple levels in a short period of time. And Miss Lee, who used to have a little bit of capital, had plummeted because of Ava. It seemed that she couldn't even pay her rent now and was looking for a cheaper place. Sierra heaved a sigh of relief. She lowered her head. But Ava... Seeing her like this, the manager leaned over to see what she was looking at on her phone. The hot search page on Twitter was displayed. The top three hot searches had exploded. Zeke and Noah followed each other. Zeke and Noah both followed Ava. Ava. Zeke followed many people, so this wasn't very surprising. The main focus was on Noah, the anomaly in the entertainment industry. He only followed 10 people on Twitter, and now he suddenly followed two more people? One of them was Zeke, so the netizens immediately went crazy. They flocked to Zeke and Ava's Twitters and bumped them onto the hot search. Ava's Twitter increased by 2 million fans in one afternoon. There were 230,000 tweets on the trending page asking who this young lady was. Sierra only had 10,000 replies to her tweets total and felt involuntarily jealous of Ava. It's okay. The manager glanced at her indifferently. Sierra, don't worry. She has problems and will lose her popularity in a day or two. This is only temporary. You're different from her. Sierra remembered that she believed Lady Luck was on her side and felt a little relieved upon hearing his words. Unlike the situation in Sierra's room, Ava's room was somewhat silent. Ava was packing her things. Sierra has someone supporting her. Miss Lee was sitting on a chair with a cigarette in her hand. I was told by the staff just now that the director even cut some of Bessie's scenes. Episode 315 Ava Lies to Bessie Ava pursed her lips. When she heard that she had been asked to leave the show, she hadn't shown any disappointment, mainly because she was used to her role as a side character. But she couldn't bear it any longer when she heard about Bessie. Bessie's footage has been deleted as well? She threw her bag onto the table, unable to conceal her anger. Why? Isn't she Zeke's niece? The director dares to delete her scenes? Bessie had garnered many fans in the production crew these last two days. Some of them had sympathized with Ava and Bessie and had hence informed Miss Lee of the truth. It's very simple logic. Powerful people are covering for Sierra. Even Zeke can't offend that person. Miss Lee spat out a smoke ring. Pursing her lips tightly, Ava started packing quickly, feeling very guilty. She was fine yesterday. Was it because of my arrival? I didn't expect to affect her. Miss Lee, let's leave quickly. I should have listened to you from the beginning and not come here. Ava continued. She regretted her decision. Miss Lee, I think my former manager is right. I've got rotten luck. You should terminate my contract when we return to Evanston. She didn't have many things, but Bessie had left her plenty of stuff. Ava stuffed all the extra things into her own suitcase. They weren't big shots and left the hotel without wearing sunglasses. When passing by the town entrance, Ava saw the small house where Bessie was staying, but she passed right by it. She didn't dare to say goodbye to her. The moment they met, the production crew had wanted to delete her footage. She was afraid that if they met again, all of her scenes would be deleted. At the same time, in the small house, Bessie was eating with Marvin and Michael. Tonight's dinner was scrumptious. 
Bessie glanced at the boiled meat placed in front of her. When Michael's phone lit up, he took it, glanced at it, and put down his fork. Hey, your friend left, he slowly said. Who? Bessie picked up a piece of boiled meat without looking up. The one who plays the violin. Michael calmly looked at her. I guess she was driven away by the production crew. She's at the town entrance now. Pausing, she looked up at him with narrowed eyes. Ava? His phone rang again and he looked down at it. Oh, her car has been stopped. Ava's car was stopped on the mountain road. In November, the weather had turned cold. The cold wind at night blew in through the cracks around the car windows, and Ava couldn't help but shrink her shoulders. She leaned back and was about to fall asleep. At this moment, her phone rang. It was Bessie. She immediately picked it up. Bessie's voice was emotionless, and she simply asked, Where are you? I'm in the car, about to head back to Evanston. Ava immediately sat upright and smiled, her voice no different from usual. Actually, I accepted a script when I came here. I have to go back to film it now. Time was too tight, so I didn't say goodbye to you. Bessie muttered, Okay and then hung up the phone. The car finally started. Miss Lee turned to look at Ava. You didn't tell her that you were kicked out by the production crew? Given Bessie's character, it's best not to mention it to her. Ava looked solemn. Don't be fooled by her nonchalance. Her memory is very good, and she keeps everything in her heart. If I mention it to her, She'll go directly to the production crew. Miss Lee, you also said that that person supporting Sierra comes from a big background, and even Zeke doesn't dare to offend him. So it would be worse for Bessie. After all, Zeke is part of the Miller family. For a few hours, the car drove on the bumpy road to the city. It was 5 a.m. when they arrived. Ava and Miss Lee rushed through the airport, but the airport management was strict. Their flight was at 7 a.m., and they had arrived early to pass the security check. They had to get in line to get their boarding pass and check their luggage. When the airport staff saw their ID cards, she smiled and then made a phone call. Within one minute, two security guards came over and took them directly to the VIP lounge. The polite airport staff also served them breakfast and coffee. Your flight has been arranged. You will be able to depart in 10 minutes. Not all first-class passengers could come to the VIP lounge. Most could only access the first-class reception room. The VIP lounge was for specific people only. Ava and even Miss Lee panicked a little as they entered the VIP lounge for the first time. What happened? Miss Lee asked blankly. Ava also looked dazed. She looked down at her phone. It was only 5 a.m. and their flight was at 7 a.m., but they were leaving in 10 minutes? 10 minutes later, the airport staff reappeared and continued to politely and respectfully lead them to the air passage. After walking for two minutes, the two of them arrived on a private jet. Other than the pilot seat and the co-pilot seat, there were only four other seats. The plane set off once the flight attendants fastened their seat belts. Ava, is this your friend's work? Miss Lee stared at her in shock. Unlike Ava, she was older and had been in the entertainment industry for a long time, so she naturally knew more. Having a private jet wasn't surprising, but to be able to park at the Honolulu International Airport and occupy the passenger plane's flight channel in Hawaii's busy airport, what kind of person was this? After nearly 40 minutes, the private jet descended towards a small town that looked familiar to them. It landed in a field. The pilot took off his headset and smiled. Ladies, we're here. Ava and Miss Lee glanced outside, only to see that they were not far from the small house where Bessie said she was staying. They exchanged glances, then got out of the plane. A man was standing on the steps of the house as they approached. He didn't seem surprised at their arrival, and his expression remained graceful and beautiful. Come in, she's having breakfast. He turned sideways and led them to the dining room upstairs. Bessie was leaning back in a chair in the dining room, holding a cup of milk in her hands. She raised an eyebrow when she saw them. Eat first. 
Although she seemed no different from usual, Ava felt a little terrified. I knew it must be you. She didn't think as much as Miss Lee and just pulled out a chair, wanting to sit on Bessie's left side. However, she was immediately pulled to her right side by Miss Lee. Why did you have them bring me here? You signed with the production crew for two days, but you haven't finished filming. Bessie casually took a bite of cake. Taken aback, Ava just laughed. Did Zeke tell you? I made sure not to say goodbye to them. It was enough for me to stay one day in the program group, and I even became friends with Zeke and Noah. Today's filming is at 7.30 a.m. You guys take a shower to clean up after eating. Bessie raised her hand and looked at her phone. Bessie, I really can't shoot. Ava smiled wryly at the mention of this. Actually, I've already damaged you by being here. The production crew wants to delete your scenes. I've already increased in millions of followers, and it was already worthwhile for me, you know? She watched as Bessie continued eating. She nodded without showing any emotions. A little anxious, Ava stood up with her fork. I'll tell you the truth. Sierra must be favored by the program group's investors. Don't go against them and don't be impulsive. You can't afford to offend them. It's not worth it to provoke them because of me. She trailed off. Marvin came in at this moment. Miss Miller, Michael, Mr. Soup is downstairs. Bessie continued eating and ignored him. Casually throwing his fork onto the table with a bang, Michael's eyebrows relaxed and he indifferently said, I have no time to see him. Marvin silently prayed for Robert, then took a piece of cake from the table. While eating the cake, he went downstairs to deliver the unfortunate news. Downstairs, Marvin opened the door and saw Robert standing there, still wearing a suit. He glanced at him sympathetically while taking a bite of cake. So? Robert's heart sank to the pit of his stomach, and his handsome face crumpled a little. Wait, you're still in the mood to eat? Tell me, what did I do? He had just arrived in the town and had hurried over after hearing from Daniel that Michael and Bessie were staying here. Turn left in 600 feet and walk straight. You'll see the production you invested in. Marvin swallowed the cake and calmly said, I don't know much, but Michael does. It's all because of your production crew. Robert remembered that Bessie had asked twice about Sierra. He didn't waste time with Marvin and directly went to find the production crew. In the hotel, the director and assistant director didn't get much sleep and were still discussing how to ease Robert's anger. In the morning, they were sitting in the broadcasting room, full of worry. Before they could say a word, a staff member hurried over, looking terrified. Director, President Soup is here. So early? The director glanced at the time. It was only 6 a.m. Did he come here overnight? Did he value Sierra so much? The staff member nodded and replied sternly. President Soup's expression is very dark and he seems very angry. The director felt even more panicked and immediately stood up. They walked outside. Every time the staff member said something, the director and assistant director's hearts sank even further. The director glanced at the staff member. Call Sierra down. The staff member went upstairs. Most of the staff members were already up at this time and a few stood outside, quietly inquiring about the situation, not daring to say a word. Robert stood in the middle of the hall with his hands clasped behind his back. His eyes were cold as he glanced at the director and the assistant director. Although he followed Bessie and Daniel around like their puppy, as the only heir of the Soup family, his imposing aura shouldn't be underestimated. Episode 316, Sierra Gets Ignored. The assistant director looked down, not daring to look at him. Resisting his imposing aura, the director invited him to the reception room that they had cleaned up last night. President Soup, please come in. The others stood rooted to the ground, not daring to speak. Only when Robert went into the reception room did they collectively heave a sigh of relief. Inside the reception room, Robert sat down on the sofa and massaged his eyebrows. What's the situation with a production group recently? 
The director respectfully poured him a cup of tea and replied with his head lowered. President Soup, don't worry, we've already taken care of Sierra. The shots of the physics problem will definitely be deleted. Sierra? Robert frowned tightly. The director could tell that his tone was getting colder and colder, so he hurriedly said, And as for Mr. Miller's niece, her shots can bring huge benefits to the production crew. You're an investor, so you must be after benefits as well. But if you really don't want her scenes, then we can delete them. Last night, the director had listed a series of benefits to show Robert. But after seeing how uptight he was, he didn't dare to mention them. Robert was starting to have an inkling of what happened. Mr. Miller's niece? The director hurriedly explained. Yes, we discussed it with the editing team last night. We can delete most of Bessie's scenes, but not Noah's. Hence, some of her scenes will have to be kept, or Noah's scenes would be weird. Slamming the cup down with a bang, Robert looked up at the director, his gentle face instantly stiffening. Come again? Whose scenes are you going to delete? Robert's expressions and voice didn't seem right. The director looked up. Bessie's scenes. Robert was no fool, but he had never expected that. This man actually had time to record a show, and unfortunately, it was the show he invested in. The production crew even wanted to delete her scenes. But Bessie definitely wasn't angry over this kind of thing, since she didn't care about her screen time. He composed his face and said, Explain what happened between Sierra and Miss Miller from beginning to end. Don't leave out any minor details. The director was shocked. Robert had actually called her Miss Miller? Had things taken a new turn? They exchanged glances, and he explained about Tucker, Ava, Noah, and Sierra from the start to end in detail. So you guys drove away Ava, whom Miss Miller invited. Robert glanced at the director and nodded. Very good. Bessie had brought Zeke and Noah along, who both had their own following. But Ava, whom she wanted to support, had been kicked out by the production crew without a word. Squeezing his phone, Robert stood up and glanced at the production crew. If you don't want to be murdered, get up quickly and arrange the next scenes for Ava. Mur murdered The director gasped. Sneering, Robert clutched his head, frantic. Let alone, if this matter isn't handled well, I will also suffer. Why did you chase away the person she wanted to be in the show? She even personally invited her. Are you tired of living? Robert didn't bother explaining to them and instead took out his phone to call Daniel. Two minutes later, Daniel replied coolly, Send me the show's location. Robert heaved a sigh of relief when he heard this. Good, it seemed like Bessie was still willing to talk to him. He glanced at the two directors. What are you dazed for? Hurry up and prepare for today's show. Ava will also participate. Do you know what to do? The assistant director reacted more stupidly than the director. Then, what about the script for promoting Sierra? Sierra? Robert already knew that the Soup Corporation was promoting Sierra. Instead of replying to the assistant director, he directly called the Soup Corporation headquarters. His eyebrows raised sharply. Which idiot wanted to promote Sierra? He asked. The manager on the other end of the phone had just gotten out of bed and was suddenly yelled awake by Robert's violent words. He remembered Sierra and quickly replied, President Soup, you personally asked about Sierra. That was because Miss Miller mentioned her. I only asked you if there was such a person. Who are you to take matters into your own hands? Robert desperately wanted to appear in front of the manager and beat him up. The two directors listened to their long conversation in a trance. Then, they exchanged glances. So, they had gotten everything wrong? The Soup Corporation had wrongly promoted Sierra? And all of this started with Bessie. Without waiting for Robert to speak further, the director immediately made an oath. President Soup will definitely promote Ava well and redeem our merits, don't worry. Upstairs in Sierra's room, the manager was trembling with excitement. President Soup is here. The director asked you to go down to receive him. Sierra, change your clothes and put on makeup. Let's go downstairs quickly. President Soup? 
Sierra had closed her eyes to let the makeup artist fix her up. Upon hearing this, her eyelashes trembled. Yes, President Soup, I heard that he didn't even call for Zeke and asked only for you to see him. The manager's hands were still trembling as he urged Sierra. Wear something nicer, Sierra. You've really hit the sky in one step this time. Let alone the entertainment industry, even in the entirety of Evanston, the Soup Corporation was considered top of the pyramid and was the well-deserved overlord of the entertainment circle. Everyone they promoted shot to fame. Every program they produced became famous. At the mention of President Soup, Sierra couldn't bear it anymore. She had met Robert in the Soup Corporation before. He was tall, handsome, gentle, and had a doctor's background. He had even received a doctorate degree in economics from Northwestern University. Most importantly, he was clean living and honest, and never had any scandals. He was one of the top five kings in the entertainment industry. Hurriedly getting up, she changed from her sportswear to a sky-blue dress. To avoid being unsightly, she didn't wear a coat. After putting on makeup, she rushed downstairs. Today's show was scheduled to start at 7.30 a.m. By the time she finished her makeup and changed her clothes, it was 7.10 a.m. when they came downstairs. Robert and the director had just come out of the reception room. Recognizing Robert at a glance, Sierra and her manager stepped forward. Robert's originally cold and tense expression seemed to pause when he saw them. His complexion became gentler, and he walked straight in their direction. Sierra's body was tense and she gripped the corners of her dress. When Robert was two steps away from her, she opened her mouth. Mr. Before she finished her sentence, Robert directly passed her and then politely greeted Zeke, who had just come down the stairs. Mr. Miller, hello. His attitude was very rigorous and respectful. He had even addressed him formally. Robert and Zeke knew of each other, but were not familiar with each other, especially since the Miller family had already withdrawn from the four major families. In terms of current status, the Miller family was below the Soup family, and Zeke had no real power in his hands. Even if it had been the fourth son of the Miller family, with the Soup family's fiery status in relation to the Clark family, Robert could have directly ignored him. But Robert was suddenly so respectful to him. Pursing his thin lips slightly, Zeke's clear and dark eyes showed a hint of confusion, but he lowered his eyelashes to cover his expression. President Soup. He felt even more surprised inside, so it turned out that the Soup Corporation had invested in this show. But why was Robert here? Robert had already turned to look at Tucker. Tucker, is your foot better? Robert knelt down again to look at Tucker's foot. It seems like Daniel's medicine is still very effective. Mr. Soup. Tucker had seen Robert in the school doctor's office and was familiar with him and Samuel. Are you looking for my sister? He looked up. Robert vaguely replied, Yes, the show is about to start. Let's go. He took Tucker and the others aside. But he didn't know that their slightly familiar conversation had shocked everyone in the room. The show had planned to start recording in the hotel, and Katie also happened to come downstairs moments earlier. She was shocked when she saw this scene and couldn't help but walk over to Zeke. She covered her microphone and asked, Zeke, how does Tucker know President Soup? Unaware of the situation, Zeke just pursed his lips and followed the others. I'm not sure. They went outside together. Only Sierra stood on the spot with her manager and her cameraman. Having one cameraman was the standard treatment for rookies. In the past, Sierra had always received the same treatment as Zeke and had five full-time cameramen following her from all angles. Feeling uneasy, the manager watched as the assistant director walked towards the studio. He chased after him, looking very angry as he asked, Didn't you ask Sierra to see President Soup? In the past few days, the manager had realized that the director's team was very polite to him and Sierra. Thus, the manager's attitude had become very entitled. Otherwise, he wouldn't have pressured the directors to force Ava to leave last night. 
His tone was naturally rough when he talked to the assistant director at this moment. Unexpectedly, the originally polite assistant director just lightly glanced at him. President Soup doesn't need to see you. What happened to Sierra's cameramen? One isn't enough. The manager frowned. Upon hearing this, the assistant director glanced at him and indifferently said, Sierra's cameramen have gone to film someone else. But of course, if you think it's insufficient, you can leave the show. He finished speaking and impatiently went upstairs. The manager took a step back and didn't dare to say more. He watched as the crew's car was about to drive away and hurriedly told Sierra to run to it. Ever since joining the crew, Sierra had sat in a special car, but at this time, she was huddled together with the staff. She was even wearing a dress that revealed her legs and felt very uncomfortable. Most importantly, the director's attitude just now had panicked her. Bessie and Ava arrived at the show's location earlier than everyone. Getting out of the car and surveying the surroundings, Ava saw that this was a newly developed, scenic spot. It looked like a garden and had been closed off by the staff. Only a few people were around, and she noticed the program's sign placed in one spot. Realizing that this was the show's filming location, she immediately grabbed Bessie and wanted to leave. Bessie, why did you bring me here? This is the program's filming location. Episode 317 Noah's Elusive Arranger Bessie folded her arms and leaned indifferently against a tree, motionless. Screech! The production crew's cars stopped one by one. A man in a suit got out of the first car, his expression cold and imposing. He was followed by the director, who was smiling in a respectful and flattering way. Zeke and the others also got out of that car. Glancing around, Ava realized that the one person who was worthy of such treatment was probably the person Miss Lee had talked about. The production crew's executive, Bessie Lutz first. She didn't expect Bessie to be so rigid and motionless. She didn't finish her sentence. The production crew's executive came over. The coldness and solemnity on his face completely swept away. He quickly apologized. Miss Miller, sorry to make you wait. He looked around and saw a stool that the production crew had prepared. Quickly moving it, he placed it next to Bessie. Please sit down first. Oh, are you thirsty? Do you need water? The director didn't expect that Mr. Soup would instantly become like this, but he also reacted quickly and hurriedly trotted over to his car to take out a clean cup and water. He was about to pour the water when Robert snatched it. He looked up. Robert glanced coldly at him. What are you doing? Having always been able to adapt to situations, Robert's survival instincts stimulated his speed even more, and his expression looked sinister. Frightened, the director let go. President Soup, you, you can pour it. He immediately retreated three steps. A cold sweat broke out on his back. At first, he hadn't been so scared when he heard Robert address Bessie as Miss Miller. But after seeing his attitude, he was really shocked at this moment. He originally thought that Robert's phrase, I will also suffer, was just alarmist talk. But it didn't seem so after seeing his attitude. The director realized that if Bessie really wanted to haggle over every ounce with them, everyone other than Zeke, Tucker, and her friends would suffer including Robert. Everyone in Evanston, especially the entertainment industry, trod with caution, for fear that he would accidentally offend someone powerful. But the director didn't expect that even after being cautious his whole life, he had finally offended someone from the Soup Corporation. Having always thought that Bessie was Zeke's niece, he apprehensively recalled whether he had offended her in any other way except Ava's situation in the past two days. Beside him, Robert turned his gaze away. After his trip to Austria with Daniel last year, he had increased his knowledge of the world. Not to mention his understanding of the status of Michael and the Clark family in Evanston. 
even just thinking about the manor on the other side of Austria and Michael's diamond boss persona that frightened him and Daniel terribly, made him wish he could forget some of those memories. Furthermore, Bessie had even made a crack in the ring after fighting with Carrie. His deep fear of her came from the bottom of his heart. This time, it seemed like he had really offended her, and Michael didn't even bother to pay attention to him. He knew that Bessie was a grumpy person, and he had called Daniel in the lounge just now only to be ignored as well. Looking up, it felt like if he didn't take care of this girl, who had several important people behind her, he would soon suffer in Evanston. At the frightening thought of being dominated by Michael, he cursed his subordinates silently several times. Then, he finished pouring the water very familiarly and turned around to hand it to Bessie. His movement was smooth from his experience serving Daniel. Miss Miller, is the temperature okay? Is it too hot or is it too cold? Seeing Bessie finally take the cup after pausing for a few seconds, Robert heaved a sigh of relief. Then, he turned to Ava and immediately became gentle and elegant. His face even expressed a sincere apology. You're Miss Hutchinson, right? My apologies because of my subordinates' mishandling. We've caused you to suffer. It's all a misunderstanding. As for the next show... Ava was speechless. His following words fell on deaf ears because she was utterly shocked now. Robert glanced towards the director, who understood his look immediately and waved to the remaining cameramen. All the remaining five cameramen aimed their cameras at Ava. Bessie hadn't come to delay the production crew's filming process. It was already 7.30 at the moment. She took the cup and walked aside, out of Ava's camera range, exiting the frame. Robert's spirit, which had been tense from last night until now, finally eased. I was wondering why I didn't see you, Ava. It turns out that you came early. The show had started recording, and Katie had also recovered from the shock. Her sophisticated acting skills once again successfully concealed her expression, and her tone was normal as she spoke to Ava. She successfully involved several others in the scene. Noah calmly walked over and greeted Ava as usual, and even asked if she could send him her composition. The show was slowly getting on track. Having been famous since he was young, what major event hadn't Zeke experienced in the entertainment industry after so many years? He calmly glanced in Robert's direction. He wouldn't mention the fact that Robert knew Bessie, but the main thing was, with the Soup family's current status, Robert didn't have to behave like this to people outside the Clark family. Naturally, Zeke had already guessed that Robert had treated him so politely at the hotel because of Bessie. Zeke, Katie glanced at him and covered her microphone. Missing your niece? Nodding, Zeke's delicate eyebrows knitted together, and he muttered to himself, Yes, I was wondering if she would still accept the Miller family. Originally, he had thought that once Jack saw Bessie, she might return to the Miller family, or perhaps bring them back to the old days. After all, although the Miller family was indeed in dire straits, it still wasn't comparable to ordinary families. Moreover, a hidden card was always necessary in Evanston. The Miller family wasn't very powerful, but could still be Bessie's backing. But now, compared to the Soup family, he would rather not let her return to the Miller family. What? Katie didn't hear clearly. He shook his head. Nothing. He reached out to take the task card from Katie calmly, deep in thought. Nodding, Katie was still covering the microphone. Your niece is so weird. Zeke glanced at her and paused. You're weird. Katie quickly changed her choice of word. I mean, mysterious. Mysterious. You said her family had been abducted all those years ago. So what did she do during that time? Zeke looked down at the mission card and ignored her. Robert was one step behind Bessie when the production crew started filming. He lowered his voice and carefully asked, Miss Miller, shall we go back? This matter had blown over, right? Putting down the cup on the table, Bessie glanced at him with dark eyes and a lukewarm expression, 
and then indifferently nodded. She turned sideways and was about to round a corner. A wide passage opened in front of her, with a speed most of the crew had never seen before in their lives. The movements of the twenty or so staff on the production crew caused a breeze. Bessie was speechless. Seriously? She and Robert walked back through the path they had opened up. Everyone involuntarily stared in their direction. Only then did they discover the black car parked not far away. Robert first opened the door of the back seat for Bessie to enter, before taking the passenger seat. As soon as he entered, he saw Marvin in the driver's seat with a lollipop in his mouth, looking blankly at him. He even greeted him. Mr. Soup. Mr. Soup. He really wanted to fight him now. Back on set, after watching the black car drive away, the director wiped the cold sweat on his forehead and directed all the cameras at Ava. In the middle of the recording, he asked if Ava was cold. Used to being taken care of by the crew, Sierra was now wearing a knee-length skirt that exposed her legs to the air. The cold wind hit her and goosebumps popped up all over her body, but she didn't dare to ask the director to go back. She was afraid that if she went back, she really wouldn't have a single scene today. She just tried hard to motion to her manager. But the manager was still staring at Ava in shock and didn't seem to notice her situation. Sierra, who always thought she had Lady Luck on her side, really couldn't bear it anymore. She racked her brains and still couldn't think of what had gone wrong. Ava had indeed cozied up to someone powerful. But what did that have to do with her luck? The production crew's atmosphere was different from usual today, and even Zeke, who adapted well to different situations, couldn't avoid it. But two people were still the same as usual. One was Tucker, Bessie's younger brother. The second was Noah. Other than Tucker, he was the only one who remained genuinely calm from beginning to end after seeing Robert. After thinking of his relationship with Bessie, Katie still didn't dare to address him as so casually. She didn't dare to go overboard. Amidst the production crew, Zeke's manager finally went to find Simon. Zeke's manager had followed the crew and was now well acquainted with Simon. They had even exchanged Twitter information. Knowing that Zeke was Bessie's uncle, Simon had been very polite to Zeke's manager. Is Noah very familiar with President Soup as well? The manager glanced at Simon and asked. Shaking his head, Simon bluntly said, No. Then... Why was Noah so calm? Was his IQ really as low as rumored on the internet? Simon seemed to have seen through his thoughts and didn't dare to mock him at the thought that Zeke was Bessie's uncle. He just said, You know that Noah's journey has been... Magnanimous, right? The manager nodded. Yes, because he has so many fans and a god-level arranger. He has an unprecedented influence in the music scene. The god-level arranger Nico was extremely elusive. Yes, a god-level arranger. Simon pursed his lips and lowered his voice. Many singers have spent a lot of money to check on our arranger, but do you know why none succeeded? Feeling like he had just discovered a top secret of the entertainment industry, the manager leaned in close and said cautiously, Go on. Simon looked at him and quietly said, Because she's a member of the World Poker Tour. Episode 318 His last name is Clark. Before seeing Bessie, Simon knew that Nico was a senior member of the World Poker Tour. After all, Noah directly mailed everything to the World Poker Tour, and if Bessie didn't want it, someone from the World Poker Tour would treat it as a treasure and respectfully return it. The Grammy trophy that Noah had sent last time had ended up with this fate, but he had refused to accept it back. Thinking of this, Simon felt like Noah was sometimes very bold. In places like the entertainment industry, if Noah didn't have the World Poker Tour's backing, he would have fallen from grace several years ago given his personality. Noah was also clear about this, so he hadn't been surprised to see Robert. Upon hearing this, 
Zeke's manager was speechless. Although the Soup family was strong, compared to the World Poker Tour, which was a big American company, he couldn't help but look up at the sky. They weren't comparable. They finished recording at 5 p.m., and although it was a little better when Bessie was around, the footage still wasn't considered too bad. Still, the effect of the evening tour to the garden that the production crew had wanted didn't appear. The prepared horror house wasn't used either. Because Bessie wasn't around, the crew had even happily prepared a variety of colored lights. The director stared at Tucker on the screen, speechless. In the end, the assistant director comforted him. Director, think about it. He's much better than his sister. At least we didn't have to use as many brain cells as we did last night, right? If it was his sister today, we would have wrapped up without even walking to the other half of the garden. The director felt like his reassuring words were very reasonable. Sierra had already taken a bath upstairs and changed into her clothes and a padded jacket. Maybe it was because she had been frozen the whole day, but her face was drained of color now. Her manager stood beside her trying to comfort her. Your luck has always been good. Trust me, it'll be okay in a few days. He now had no other artists under his hands as he had taken full care of Sierra after terminating his contract with Ava. Sierra was now his source of easy money, so he must stabilize her mentality. After comforting her, he went downstairs to find the director, wanting to sound out opinions. A familiar staff member took him to the editing room. Out of the staff members who all knew Ava and Bessie's affair, this one was most familiar with Sierra's manager. We've been friends for many years, so let me tell you the truth. The staff member lowered his voice. Cancel the contract with Sierra as soon as possible. After this program is over, she'll be thrown to the wolves. Why? The manager was horrified. Wasn't the production crew promoting her? What on earth happened? Promoting her? The staff sneered. That was because a subordinate made a mistake. Miss Miller is President Soup's friend and also Ava's friend. Knowing Ava's past grievances with Sierra, she just asked President Soup about her, but his subordinates mistook his intention and thought he wanted to promote Sierra. The manager pursed his lips. He looked calm on the surface, but his heart was overwhelmed, and his blood felt like it was flowing backward. You know what happened later on, don't you? The show team was promoting Sierra initially, but unfortunately, Bessie's preferred friend Ava came. The director had even kicked Ava out ahead of time and flattered Sierra to no end. Why did you think President Soup came all the way to this island? It was just to apologize to Miss Miller. The staff member's tone was a little gossipy, but he finally looked at the manager with some sympathy. Ava is the first person that the Soup Corporation wanted to promote to the top. This girl is good-looking and recognizable, and has a good temper. She's even a student of Mr. Grint at the Evanston Violin Association. Even if she's not the next Zeke Miller, she's not that far off. To sign such an artist, her manager had really used eight lifetimes of luck. I remember you used to manage Ava. Why did you suddenly cancel the contract and sign with Sierra? Aren't you too unlucky? Did Miss Lee force you? Everything the manager wondered about previously now became clear. Why were they suddenly promoting Sierra? Why did they ask Sierra to receive President Soup, only for him to ignore her? It turned out that everything was because she was the wrong person? Stopping in his footsteps, he smashed his head in extreme panic, feeling like a dark cloud had enveloped him. He didn't even have the energy to talk to the director anymore and directly returned to Sierra's room, walking like a dead man. In the beginning, he had terminated his contract with Ava to focus on promoting Sierra. Until now, he had patted himself on the back for terminating the contract with Ava. Without doing that, he wouldn't have his current achievements. But now, after listening to the staff member's words, in the small house, Marvin was packing up some things he had used these days. After Robert returned, he slept for a while and finally woke up. He was now sitting in the courtyard downstairs. We're leaving tomorrow morning? Yes, 
Marvin expressionlessly pulls the zipper of the suitcase. We're departing at 5.30 a.m. Robert crossed his legs and flipped through Twitter. He clicked on Daniel's profile and forwarded a piece of news to him. Regarding the things you knew, hopefully it's not too late for me to thank you. So early? Having received no reply, he put his phone on the table, glanced upstairs and lowered his voice. Miss Miller isn't getting up? Yeah, she's very restrained now. Marvin thought for a while before replying. Robert was silent for a moment. Restrained? Yes, if this had happened last year, Marvin glanced at him and continued. Miss Miller would have killed you without a word. You can ask Samuel about it when he was in Chicago. He saw Miss Miller fight a couple of times. Of course, this didn't count. Though Miss Miller's fight records from the first and second grades were truly impressive, it was the most aggressive record he had ever seen and almost exceeded two pages. The most important thing was Michael didn't even spare it a glance and didn't erase it even though he could. Of course, the most embarrassing thing was still what happened to Northwestern University. When he first went to go through the formalities, the teacher had actually praised the records as beautiful. Marvin thought back. She would fight to solve disagreements? After listening to him, Robert silently poured himself a cup of cool tea. Only after he drank it did he feel his heart calm down. Outside, Ava and Miss Lee spent a day recording the show and came back to find Bessie. Bessie was upstairs, so Ava greeted Marvin and the others before heading up. As her manager, Miss Lee naturally was inclined to make social connections. After inquiring about Marvin's last name, she took out her phone. Ava finished speaking with Bessie and came downstairs to find Miss Lee frozen in place. Are you okay? She asked. Miss Lee had been calm when she heard about Robert, but why did she look so shocked now? Shaking her head, Miss Lee followed Ava out. After they were a hundred feet away from the small house, she finally heaved a sigh of relief. Ava tilted her head. Miss Lee, what on earth happened? Do you know the last name of the driver who drove us today? In a daze, Miss Lee turned back toward the small house and answered without waiting for Ava. His last name is Clark. Marvin had come to inquire about the situation at the Clark family's building in Hawaii. The security guard was counting the goods and personnel. They would arrive at the airport before 7 o'clock tomorrow, so most of them were present except for a small team of people. Those people were Aaron's staff in Hawaii and the core employees at this time. The security guard knew that if there was any trouble at the airport, Aaron would probably come forward to save the situation. At that time, he would help resolve Michael's big mistake. So much of the goods would remain and not much damage would be caused to the Clark family. That was why he had sent the news to Aaron that day. He anticipated all of this, but did not expect that Aaron was actually unwilling to clean up Michael's mess and had been so cruel as to directly separate his team from them. The security guard massaged his eyebrows and called for the team leader. Aaron isn't doing charity. The team leader glanced at him with a smile. Michael should clean up his own mess. Aaron won't get himself involved. This is for the overall interest of the Clark family. Aaron. The Clark family was now heavily divided, and Aaron had already started assembling talent to his side. The guard had always been impartial and had not stood on any side. Aaron had sent his confidant to privately find him in Hawaii, but he had rejected him. Sir, you've worked hard on Hawaii's forces for several years. If you don't want your power to shrink by half because of Michael's misconduct, you should leave his force and join us. I can guarantee that Aaron will be able to return your men and the goods to Evanston intact. The team leader calmly said, walking with Aaron's men meant that he had chosen a side, but the security guard was loyal to Joshua and couldn't do such a thing. He was determined to use Michael's misconduct to wake Joshua up. He just hadn't expected Aaron's behavior. As the guard sat down in low spirits, Marvin, who had stayed silent at the back, calmly drank his cup of tea. I'm going back now. Miss Miller is looking for me. 
Meet me on time tomorrow. Hearing how calm he was, the security guard's heart jumped, and he glanced up hopefully. Michael has cleared the barrier? Marvin looked blank. What barrier? The security guard's hopes were immediately dashed. If we don't clear the checkpoint, we won't be able to pass the inspection. How come? With Michael, those things are essentially non-existent. Marvin looked at the guard blankly. After all, it wasn't the first time Michael had run a job at an airport. The team leader looked at Marvin's calm face and couldn't help but sneer. The Clark family's third son was stupid, and even his men were too. Episode 319, A Showdown Did they think this was Evanston? That everyone would give difference to the Clark family's crown prince? Even in Evanston, they couldn't pass the inspection like this, let alone in Hawaii. Essentially non-existent, how was that possible? Did they treat the airport forces as non-existent? Thinking about this, he looked up at Marvin sarcastically. The team leader didn't bother listening to the conversation further. Since the security guard was too stubborn to heed his advice, he stopped trying to persuade him and left the study. Marvin also finished his tea and put down the teacup. He waited for the team leader to close the door before glancing at the security guard. Remember, tomorrow, your men and the goods will take off at 7 o'clock. You must arrive on time at the location. The security guard was a little shocked to see Marvin behave so seriously for the first time and subconsciously nodded. After that, Marvin also left. The security guard's subordinates came to inquire anxiously about the mission. Sir, do you really want to take all the men and goods tomorrow? Aaron is really not helping. Will we all be detained there? It would indeed be a big loss to the security guard if they were detained there, and he would be powerless by the time he returned to the Clark family. He was on the fence about the matter and deep in thought, and his eyes happened to meet the teacup Marvin had just drunk from. He suddenly paused. Quickly standing up, he reached out for the cup. Smash! The teacup immediately fell apart at the lightest touch and broke into pieces on the table. What kind of force could silently crush the teacup like this? Thinking of Marvin's words, he slapped the table, thought for a while, and said with trembling eyes, We'll go to the airport tomorrow morning. Marvin came out of the building and looked down to blankly send a message to Bessie. Miss Miller, why couldn't I crush the cup in front of him? In fact, I could have crushed it even more. I secretly crushed it. But would he know that it was because of me? Did I crush it for nothing? Bessie ignored him. Anxious, Marvin texted to ask Patrick the same thing. He told Marvin to shut up. The next day at five in the morning, Michael and Bessie set off, with Robert following them. They went downstairs and saw a private jet parked in the middle of the courtyard. Robert glanced at Michael. Michael, don't tell me this is our transportation today. Handing Bessie's luggage to Marvin, Michael casually glanced at him in response. You can skip it if you don't like it. Robert quickly denied this. Of course not, but I remember that all major cities have limited flights, so I'm afraid we will be detained. We can do this in Evanston, but isn't it too arrogant in Hawaii? Michael glanced at him. Robert automatically understood his look to mean, This is considered arrogant? Robert was speechless. You're so arrogant. With complicated thoughts, he followed Marvin onto the private jet, worried that he would be blown up along the way. But 40 minutes later, he arrived at the airport unscathed and in a daze. When did Michael get the flight order? Robert wiped his face and glanced at Marvin. Marvin was even more surprised. What's a flight order? Robert observed his face and realized that he really didn't know, so he narrowed his eyes in Michael's direction. Why did he feel like this trip to Hawaii was full of weird things? The airport staff first took Robert and Marvin to the flight passageway, which was different from the ordinary flight passageway. They didn't check Robert's luggage, and there wasn't a boarding pass. Shocked, Robert was about to ask the airport staff about this. 
But when he saw how calm and normal Marvin looked, he politely handed his things to the stewardess and asked her to do the check-in, pretending everything was normal. Mr. Soup, what's the matter with you? Marvin glanced at him. Robert swallowed his words and boarded the plane with Marvin, pretending to be calm. Nothing. In Inspection Zone 1 of the airport, Michael was still slowly lining up for coffee. The airport was rather crowded at this time and a dozen people were in line in front of him. Let's go find your security guard first. Bessie stood beside him without joining the line and pressed her hat down. It's half past six. They won't have time to get on the plane later. It's enough time. Michael stuck his hands in his pocket and lazily looked away from the coffee. They won't have many people. After another calculation, he slightly narrowed his cold and beautiful eyes before slowly saying, It'll probably be the security guard and his men, so about 20 or 30 people. 10 minutes is enough for them. Don't worry. Michael was punctual and naturally wouldn't make them wait too long. Bessie paused and then looked up at him. You calculated it? Of course. Michael moved up the queue. Seeing that she was still rooted to the spot in deep thought, he reached out to pull her forward and casually said, Aaron's men will make trouble. Bessie nodded, then glanced at the people in front of them. She calculated the time and thought that they would only have 10 minutes left until 7 o'clock if they bought coffee. She couldn't help but sigh. Michael. Michael glanced at her. Yeah? I don't want to drink coffee anymore. Two minutes later, they reached the physical inspection area. The security guard and his team were inside on pins and needles. Marvin had especially reminded them to leave at 7 o'clock last night so they had come at five o'clock. After all, they had many things that needed to go through routine inspections. An hour certainly wasn't enough for so many people to pass the inspection. After arriving at five o'clock, they didn't see Marvin and Michael until 6.30 a.m. Sir, Michael said we'll set off at 7 a.m., but there has been no inspection so far. Do they even know the process? The security guard's subordinate stared at the entrance. He was already irritated after waiting for more than an hour. If the inspection had started at 5 a.m., they would have had just enough time for so many people, but it was already 7.30 a.m. and they still hadn't seen Marvin or Michael. The security guard was also thinking the same thing. Had he been fooled by Marvin or had he misunderstood something last night? Seeing this, his subordinate glanced at him again. Sir, not to mention the physical inspection problem. Did Michael give you the registration information? Has he given you the boarding passes? These things. The security guard had only paid attention to Marvin's methods last night and hadn't considered these things. He gasped involuntarily. The subordinates exchanged glances. One person took out his ID and swiped it on a self-service machine not far away. There was no boarding information. He turned his head blankly towards the security guard. Sir, I have no boarding information. Did you leave out my name? How could that be? The guard asked. He had personally checked the list one by one. He took his ID and scanned it on the machine, but his flight information was also blank. Michael hadn't even helped them arrange the flight? In utter disbelief, he took his ID and went to the information desk about 30 feet away. The service staff checked his ID and then seriously looked at the security guard. You said that you have a bunch of people waiting for a flight? He asked, doubtfully. Wait a moment. The service staff immediately made a call and a team of airport security came over. The already anxious subordinates saw the security guard coming over with a depressed expression, along with several airport security personnel, and they were all shocked. The airport's security had already regarded this place as a key target and had blocked the door. Staring at the airport's security, the security guard's head spun, and he looked sideways at his subordinate's disappointment and frustrated expressions. He now regretted his arbitrary decision last night. He didn't care about himself, but if he had known that this was the case, he wouldn't have brought his subordinates and all the goods along. Sir, where's Michael? Where's Marvin? Give them a call. His confidant reminded him in a low voice. Taking out his phone, the security guard gave a wry smile, his heart feeling heavy. 
It was useless even if he called Michael now. He had just opened his address book and was staring at the name Aaron with an internal struggle when a clear voice came from the door. Here? Michael nodded and then lazily surveyed the area. He had calculated that there were about 28 people, but at this moment, a few hundred people could be seen. He paused. The security guard and the others all looked up instinctively. The security guard had waited a long time for Michael. He looked behind Michael, but didn't see any of the airport's high-level personnel. His heart skipped a beat and turned cold. He had built up the forces in Hawaii bit by bit. Originally, he had harbored hopes for Michael because of Marvin. He felt that if Marvin had such strength, then perhaps he could trust Joshua's vision. Michael, let's quickly withdraw. The security guard glanced at Michael with darkened eyes. We might still recover some of our losses. Looking away from the crowd, Michael recovered from his slight shock and slowly took out his phone. His long eyelashes drooped down, hiding his expression, and he seemed to be sending a message. He didn't seem to hear what the security guard said. The security guard watched as Michael slowly walked forward. The head of the airport's security team pressed the button on the walkie-talkie. At the door, several airport security personnel came in with weapons and tools. The security guard tried to calm down, but his face began to crack again. Michael, Hawaii isn't our base. The airport has a huge force backing it. We have developed forces on someone else's site and delivered goods that they strictly prohibited. If they forcefully detain them, Joshua won't have any way out of it either. Such a force was indeed terrifying. When Joshua had instructed Michael to come initially, the security guard had been worried that he wasn't familiar with the process. Now, it seemed like his fears had been confirmed. Michael gave no response and was still looking to his left. Episode 320 Are you looking for a boyfriend? Michael! The security guard looked at the airport's security personnel. Thinking of the loss this would cause to the Clark family and his group of loyal subordinates, he wanted to hang himself on the spot. If he had known this would happen, he would have defected to Aaron earlier. Just as he was feeling guilty and blaming himself for making such a decision, a weak voice suddenly came from behind him. Sir, they're gone and the door has been opened too. He turned to look in the direction of the door, which was also where Michael had been staring at just now. The closed door to the plane passageway had just opened. At the same time, the airport security personnel who had just come in seemed to have received new instructions and had all left. What was going on? The security guard exchanged glances with his men. Let's go. Michael checked the time on his phone. It was 6.40 a.m., about time to take off. He saw that the security guard and his men were motionless and reminded them, We'll take off at 7 a.m. sharp. The security guard and his men immediately moved. No boarding passes, no checks, no trouble, and they could just enter the plane? And the airport's security personnel had also left without warning just now. The security guard looked back involuntarily. Michael and the girl with him had already left. He hadn't said a single word from beginning to end and hadn't used words to win the airport's security over. His subordinate checked the goods and then asked, Sir, how did Michael do this? Pursing his lips, the security guard turned and glanced at the man. He groaned inwardly. Joshua's health was deteriorating, and it was about time he chose a side. Outside, Michael checked the time and saw that there were 20 minutes left. One flight had already started boarding so there were fewer people in line for coffee. He grabbed Bessie and went to line up again. He was very silent along the way. This time, it only took five minutes to get through the line. Michael took the coffee, swiped his card to pay for it, stuck the straw in, and handed it to Bessie. He frowned slightly, staring at her motionlessly. Bessie took it and looked away. Let's go and board the plane. Where are you going? Michael followed closely behind her his arms folded across his chest. C-130 
Seeming to figure something out, he chuckled softly. Marvin probably didn't have the brains to think of letting them all come today. Bessie knew that Michael's relationship with the Clark family was very mysterious. Bessie had found his initial appearance in the school doctor's office strange, and so she had checked up on him then and dug up a lot. But she hadn't investigated further since then. He seemed to have no sense of belonging to the Clark family, and there was a big age gap between him and Rosemary and Aaron. Although he seemed careless and nonchalant about the business, he was actually very concerned about Rosemary's business, and had even taken pains to start a company with her. As for the Clark family, he seemed nonchalant, but he had spent a lot of money and used his power to plan out all of this for the security guard's forces. But the security guard and the others were too indecisive and insensibly looked past his efforts. She hadn't done anything other than telling Marvin to smash the cup. Biting her straw, Bessie looked up at the sky, blocking her right ear with her empty right hand. Michael patiently took off her hand covering her right ear. What did you ask Marvin to do yesterday? Finally turning to look at him, she said her favorite two-word motto. Shut up. She was still biting the straw and holding her drink indifferently. The airport lights reflected off her face, making her skin glisten in a bright, flickering way. Michael didn't ask further since he knew that she was impatient, but when he looked at her, he suddenly paused, and something inside him made him lean down to slightly hug her from behind. His beautiful eyelashes drooped, his eyebrows were sharp, and his lowered eyes were very serious. Bessie, can I ask you one more question? Taking a sip of coffee, Bessie heard his serious tone and after thinking about it, allowed him to ask. Go on. The airport broadcast sounded at this time. Passengers going to Evanston, please note that your flight MA7737 is now boarding. Please bring your belongings, show your boarding passes, and then board the plane from gate 17. Many people were moving back and forth through the terminal, their voices mingling. Their forms created light and shadow across the floor. Looking down at her, his long eyelashes trembled slightly, and his dark and beautiful eyes concealed a small smile. Are you looking for a boyfriend now? Without waiting for her reply, he lowered his voice and said very patiently, Would you consider me? For the first time, Michael felt like the broadcast system above was very annoying. He lowered his eyes and stared at her without evasion. She was wearing her usual black sweater and stray hairs hung casually around her ears. From the side, her figure was cold and thin and gave an impression of delicacy. Michael saw that she wasn't answering and tightened his grip. This kind of posture felt too close to her and the warmth from his breath hit her ears when he spoke, transmitting small electric currents that numbed her fingertips. Bessie's eyelashes trembled. Don't get so close, she said. His usual coldness and indifference were gone. His voice was low and bewitching, stirring up her heartstrings. Then, are you going to consider it? The announcement overhead seemed like static, and the rushing figures around them had almost turned into blurs. Bessie stared at his face, taking in his sharp features that looked like they'd been meticulously drawn stroke by stroke. Was she the kind of person who was swayed by a face like that? She thought for a while, and then bowed her head in resignation. She indeed was. I'll consider it, she replied. The airport had too many people in it, and their appearances were also too outstanding. Celebrities rarely looked so good even after beauty treatments. One of them was enough to attract the attention of passerbys let alone the two of them together. Pulling up her hood, Bessie covered half of her face. The plane is about to take off. Okay. Michael's chin brushed her hair, and his voice was still slow. Then, have you considered it? She remained silent. Only after she boarded the plane while dragging her feet like a doll did she manage to compose herself. They all made it safely to Evanston, while the subordinates put the goods away, the security guard returned to the Clark family's house for a debriefing. 
The Clark family hadn't been very stable over the past few days. The fact that Joshua had given Michael the precious opportunity in Hawaii had spread throughout the family. Several rumors surfaced in the Clark family that Michael did nothing in Hawaii except play with his little girlfriend, and that because of his dereliction of duty, the forces and assets in Hawaii had shrunk by half. Aaron's confidant was in Hawaii, so he knew Michael's moves better than anyone else. Today, he had stayed at home especially to wait with the others for the security guard's return. The security guard had already reported his arrival time to Joshua in advance. Within two minutes of this time, they saw him coming in. Unlike everyone's imagination, he was full of energy and in a stable state. If any difference was to be pinpointed, he was perhaps even more imposing than before. Putting down his teacup, Joshua glanced at him solemnly. Where's Michael? The security guard bowed and respectfully replied, Michael has accompanied Miss Miller back to school. When the other guards heard this, they couldn't help but exchange glances. Michael was already famous for not doing anything, but this was going a little overboard. Without handling the important matters, he had gone to play with his girlfriend. Sure enough, beauty was harmful. Joshua, Michael is too indecisive on family matters and pays attention to his love affairs instead. He cannot be one of the three major heirs of the Clark family. A middle-aged man with sharp eyes and dark skin said. Joshua pursed his lips and the look on the man's face faded. Another person stood up and sang the same tune. This time in Hawaii, Michael was too disappointing. Although he's smart, he pays attention to personal emotions over important matters. When you asked him to lead the team at the base a few years ago, he went to study medicine halfway through the mission. This time, Hawaii's forces have suffered heavy losses all because of his impropriety. He's too distracted and cannot carry the Clark family on his shoulders. Aaron listened to them silently. The security guard paused upon hearing this and then reported to Joshua. Sir, Hawaii's forces have not suffered heavy losses. Michael has successfully recovered and returned all the goods and men to Evanston, and they're arriving soon. Successfully returned all to the Clark family's house? This security guard is indeed the head of security, if he can settle such complicated disputes in just three days. Aaron looked at him expressing praise, but secretly criticizing Michael. Having heard the ridicule in his words, the security guard wasn't bothered and just rigorously said, Except for a small group of people, all the others are here. Aaron watched his calm and unhurried state and paused with his hand on the armrest of his chair. He knew that the information he received from his confidant wouldn't be wrong. But the security guard's steady and calm attitude was beyond his expectations. The security guard's reaction was beyond everyone's expectations. Even if Joshua had gone there personally, he wouldn't have been able to return Hawaii's powers back to Evanston without an allowance of at least 10 days. They all knew in their hearts that Michael hadn't cleared the checkpoints at all. How could the security guard possibly bring everyone safely back to Evanston? Was he so upset because of Michael that he was daydreaming? At this time, Simons came in. Sir, the security guard's men have returned. They're waiting at the gate of the compound for you to debrief them. They were really all back? In disbelief, Aaron pursed his lips and followed Joshua silently to the gate. The compound was an old school ground. At this time, crowds of people were standing densely around it. Except for Aaron's small team, the security guard had brought all his men. Episode 321 The Future